David. I work at Pydantic, and I'm here to talk to you about, I guess, your Python that you're all developing with. Probably has already met Rust, so even if you haven't, maybe there is a business case for you to take, if you're interested in it, to the rest of your company. Uh, right. Um, so, yeah, the goal really, if, if you are a senior Python developer and you come talk to me as a definite Rust convert and advocate, and you say, hey, Python's proven itself, it's reliable, mainstream technology, use it all the, all the time. Rust, like lots of people are excited about it. People say great things. Is it actually okay? I will come back to you and say yes. And how I'm going to try and convince you of this is two things. I'm going to show you some examples of Python software that's already using Rust. You might be using some of that Python software without realizing. Or, indeed, maybe it's stuff that you'd be interested in trying out. Uh, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about tools that you can use to start playing around with this idea yourself, and then give you a, a little bit of an idea about where I think Rust and Python could go. My opinion might be interesting to you because um, well, I've been a software developer for about 10 years now. I've been working with Python for the entirety of that. Uh, I discovered Rust quite early on in Rust's life cycle and was a hobbyist with Rust since about 2015. From about 2020, I've worked professionally in Rust. I pretty much decided, nope, that's it. I want to work professionally in Rust. I'm not interested in working in spaces where I can't use Rust. But really, for the context of this talk, it's the fact that I am, I guess, the person that most often looks after PyO3, which we've had mentioned in a couple of the other talks, it's the piece that connects Rust and Python together. Um, so before I go further, the first example of Rust and Python working together is um, my company that I'm at, which is Pydantic. Um, you might have used this for, if you, you use Fast API, which we've had mentioned a couple of times, Pydantic and Fast API are kind of two peas in the pod. It's uh, used for data validation, but um, sort of going along Maxwell's idea of like, writing less code. I actually love Pydantic personally because it lets me write less Python code. We saw how we had like the serialize and deserialize idea and can convert Rust structures to JSON very easily. Well, in Pydantic, you create a base model or you can do it with data classes. Pydantic v2 actually even supports standard library data classes without needing to do any special conversions to your types. Um, and now that we've rewritten Pydantic in Rust, suddenly you get these massive speed ups and you can serialize JSON uh, like basically as if you didn't need to write that much code at all, and it works quite quickly. Um, but what's happened with Pydantic is it's gone from just an open source library to had some investment in it. And we're now exploring like, you know, where does this go? What are we going to build? We've got some ideas. Uh, you might have seen our company announcement or read our roadmap, but if you want to, please take a picture of this QR code and you can have a sign up. I've also got it on my phone if you want to approach me afterwards. Um, you can get some early access to what we're talking about. I'll just pause for a moment because I see a phone out. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, let, and yes, we recently approached uh, or passed our 1 billion downloads mark, which is quite an interesting milestone to celebrate. Uh, more examples of Python software that uses Rust. Well, I'll start with the biggest, which is the cryptography library. And you may or may not know but since February 2021, cryptography, the 11th most downloaded library in the Python ecosystem, has been using Rust. And I don't know if you can read the quotes at the bottom, but there were quite a few people who were not very happy about this when this change happened. Um, some of my favorites I picked out here uh, just wanted to congratulate the absolute heroes for blocking my employer's CI-CD pipeline for two weeks and possibly to the end of January. But my memory safety. You can mitigate this by getting good at C. Hope it helps. Won't read all of them because of time constraints, but really the point was is that at the time, people were like, oh, wow, we've got to deal with this thing. It's happened seemingly out of the blue for, I mean, that's a lot of people downloading cryptography. Uh, but overall, I, most people didn't necessarily even notice. For a lot of people, it just continued to go on smoothly. Uh, arguably, I think it's been a very big success. And there have been ways that the ecosystem has developed since to make it easier. One example is if you're running Alpine Linux, then in February 2021, you would have had to need a Rust compiler to install cryptography. But now you can just download cryptography and it comes pre-compiled, which is true for Linux and Windows and Mac and all the other major platforms. Um, next example, 
Polars. Um, it's a data frame library. You may have heard of it. You probably have used Pandas. Polars is an emergent one. It's February 2021, so it's two and a half years old at this point. But it claims to be the fastest one out there, or at least certainly very competitive. This little graph up here, these blue bars are Pandas, and these little purple bars that you can see are performance for Polars. Obviously, lower is better in this graph. So he's really making a case that it's a strong competitor to something that you probably use every day. Um, it's usable from both Python and Rust, and its growth of GitHub stars has been absolutely massive compared to basically every other data processing library out there. Uh, the interesting thing here is that he's had so much success that as of August, so a couple months ago, he started a company going forward to build this as a commercial product in some form. Next example is Hugging Face. Now, these are an AI company. I don't actually know too much about Hugging Face personally, but as a PIO3 maintainer, I interact with some members of their team from time to time because they've got at least two libraries that they use, which are implemented in Rust, but downloadable on Python. And you can see they've got some download stats here. Their tokenizers library is getting 2 million downloads a week. Safe Tensors library, 10 million downloads a month. Both of these are implemented in Rust, use Python for various AI tasks. Uh, again, they're having so much success that they've got more funding coming in. Uh, last round, again, August, two months ago, they got $235 million to keep doing what they're doing. And they're not purely building Rust and Python modules. They've got all sorts of other stuff that they're doing. They're a wide and diverse company. But still, I like to think that some of their success is related to Rust and Python. Finally, um, we've got Ruff. Um, you might have come across it. It's only a year old, actually. Uh, it's a linter. So if you've used tools like Flake 8 or um, uh, Black, uh, there's a, loads of others. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can talk about Ruff. But anyway, so the idea is, is that Ruff is written in Rust. Uh, we've had some testimonials, actually, uh, creator of Fast API says, Ruff is so fast that sometimes I add an intentional bug in the code just to confirm it's actually running and checking my code. Um, so again, there's a little uh, graph there that's provided on the Graph website. Um, the top bar is how long Ruff takes to do it. The middle bar, the third one is, is Flake 8, and then bottom one is PyLint. I don't know if you've used PyLint. I haven't used it for a long, long time. It's definitely unbearably slow. Um, finally, again, though, Ruff is having so much success that they've started a company based on Rust and Python. Um, and so that was actually slightly earlier this year. That was April. But hopefully, by seeing just a few of those examples, you've seen that this mixture of Rust and Python is really working for a lot of people, and not just working for them. They're having so much success that they're getting investors to pour money in to help them do this more. So maybe it's something that your company can think about, too. Um, what are the tools that you'll want to explore? Well, actually, I kind of have been beaten to the punch a little bit on this one a few times over because uh, we've talked about these kinds of ideas before. So we've mentioned microservices. Maybe you've got some Python microservices, some Rust Python microservices. You might have Rust running as its own isolated process or something like your build scripts might call Rust to do your linting. Or, I mean, you write... A, Py a Rust submodule inside your Python program, and this is what Pydantic, Cryptography, Polars, um, Axwell was showing it, you, you talked about it in your quant algorithms. So that's mostly done using PyO3, which is, again, the project that I maintain. Um, the quote we've got on GitHub for it is Rust bindings for the Python interpreter. I keep thinking I'd like to give it something better, but I can't ever think of what a better thing to describe it would be, so that's stayed there for now. Um, on the left, there's a slide that I've cribbed from a presentation I gave a couple of years ago, which is showing on the left the Python code to search for a word in uh, a long line of text. It's pretty naive. It's just breaking a word, breaking the text by lines. The lines are, if it's a match, or it's counting it even, sorry. And then on, this, on the right-hand side is the Rust equivalent. And kind of the point I'm trying to make here is it looks about the same. You can kind of mechanically make the transformation you get a speed up more or less for free. And then if you start thinking harder about how to architect your software, you might get even more speed ups. Uh, cool numbers to share. We've had 
as of this month, 16 and a half million direct downloads. And I qualify direct because you've got to think about the fact that Rust is compiled and redistributed into Python software. We looked at cryptography, that's got 200 million downloads a month. Add in all of the other software out there, I think it's very fair to say that there's billions of annual downloads of Pi3 a year, which is something that I'm very proud of. Um, and our GitHub stars, we don't have quite as many as things like Polars because we're, you know, that corner at the bottom that maybe nobody's glamorous or like exclaiming about in the same way, but it's still growing and it looks like it's trending up. Uh, there's two options to build your Python packages. Uh, Maxwell showed Setup Tools Rust, which is a very reliable option if you already use Setup Tools for your Python distribution. Uh, the one that I would probably recommend if you were getting started is this one called Maturin. It's a CLI, you can literally go Maturin new, give your project a name, bam, you get a Python Rust mix module where you can start playing around with both languages and literally see what you can build. Um, and that's been used by Pydantic, that's what Ruff uses, even though they don't have mixed Python Rust as a sub-module, they're a Rust application, they package it with Maturin. And then Polars, again, use Maturin. Um, and then finally, just a little bit about my hopes for the future. Well, first off, I would like the adoption of Rust to go a little bit further than it currently has. So, I mean, we've spoken about a lot of big examples of different things that are going very successfully, but on the top 100 Python packages downloaded, um, I think, I can't remember, maybe the stat is monthly that this list was compiled by, then I found that there were 24 that contained compiled code. Only two were Rust, and then there were a couple of others that dominated, Scythe and C. I don't really want to go into what the technologies are too much, but it would be really cool, in my mind, if we could maybe eliminate some of the C and C++ from the world, particularly, and maybe end up with a graph that looks a bit more like this. I think that would be my metric of success for Pi03. Um, what else do I hope for? Well, I want this ecosystem of Rust and Python packages to be interrelated more deeply than it currently is. So we've spoken about how easy it is to build your Polars or your, your Pydantic or whatever, but at the moment, it's really interfacing still at the Python layer. And I would love for the Rust layer to also be able to interface. Uh, I don't really want to get into the details of why and how this is complicated, but it's technically complicated. Uh, it's solvable though. The Python scientific stack, NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, they all talk together at the C layer, but C is a lot less safe than Rust, and so there's more complicated abstractions that we might want. And finally, I really hope that we see a multi-threaded Python. I don't know how closely any of you have followed the no-gill proposals. Um, basically, there's a, a contribution coming from Facebook uh, which would remove the global interpreter lock from Python maybe in the five-year horizon. And it's not yet been formally decided that this is the way Python language will go, but there's a lot of interest. So end of July, the Python Steering Council said they're quite likely to accept it. Not concrete yet. But I think with everything we've talked about, Rust's performance, multi-threading capabilities, async Rust, I think you know the next generation of Python async software could suddenly become really fantastic multi-threaded stuff if it could be powered by Rust. But we need no gel to happen first. Um, regardless, uh, we're gonna keep cracking on with all of the things I'm hoping for. Um, I, yeah, we've got loads of contributors. Like we're approaching the 300 mark, 18,000 packages reference us on GitHub apparently. Uh, maybe you can come and star us and see what we're doing. Uh, and then a little bit more of a personal plug. I, so at Pydantic, I work four days a week and the fifth day I give up my time to work on this growing ecosystem as a maintainer. So if you benefit from Pi3 or would like to see more of it, then maybe consider sponsoring me on GitHub or alternatively, I could give you some consultancy advice to help you think about adopting Rust in your own organization. Thanks for listening. <laughs>